the Queen of Denmark, always a planner, commissioned an artist in 2003 to build the elaborate glass sarcophagus she envisioned as the final resting place for herself and her husband. The four-ton tomb resting on silver elephants in Roskilde Cathedral, which reflects Margaretha's artistic ability, took 20 years to build. But when the sarcophagus for two was nearly complete, Prince Henrik announced that his wife would spend eternity alone. If she wants to bury me with her, she must make me a king consort, he told a Danish magazine. The rift between the queen and her French-born spouse has been building for decades. Although they fell madly in love when they met in London in 1965, had two sons and epitomized the hopes and dreams of Danes for a generation, their relationship was riddled with jealousy and resentment. The girl who dreamed of becoming an artist was never destined to rule. Born in a war-torn country where it was constitutionally forbidden for women to wear the crown, it was unlikely that Margaret would ascend to the throne. But once there, the queen put her country first, even her marriage. Denmark is more important to me than anything else. I don't think I ever even flirted with the idea of putting my marriage above the throne, she told her biographer. In all of Denmark, I've already been met with such high expectations. I've received so much kindness and respect. To turn my back on all this is to let down everyone who has depended on me. After five decades on the throne, Margaret is abdicating in favor of her son, Crown Prince Frederick. The monarch will devote her retirement to the things she loves most languages, art, and long walks alone in Copenhagen. Despite the personal sacrifices she has made for the crown, Margaret has said she has never once regretted her unexpected role. It's not a life sentence, but a lifetime of service, she said. Born into a royal family that never expected her to rule. Margaret the Alexandrine Thorhildur Ingrid's arrival in April 1940 was accompanied by a somewhat low-key announcement. Her parents, Frederick, eldest son of Danish King Christian X, and Ingrid, only daughter of the Crown Prince of Sweden, had been under house arrest at Amalienborg Palace since the invasion of troops. Church bells were ringing all over Copenhagen, but because of the current situation, it was not to be the British press noted about the arrival of the royal baby. The little cherubic princess, affectionately called Daisy, was not destined to rule her country. Under the rules of succession established in 1853, only male heirs were eligible to inherit the throne, and it was thought that the crown would instead go to her uncle. The childhood of Margaret and her two younger sisters, Benedicta and Anna Maria, was spent playing, drawing, and exploring the grounds of the royal palaces, where the eldest princess painted an underwater mural in one of the bathrooms. But Frederick's ascendancy after World War II marked a change in the Glucksburg household. The father of three daughters began the complicated process of adapting Denmark's constitution to allow his descendant to rule, a change that would require the approval of two successive parliaments and the Danish public. In 1953, Danes voted in a referendum to make Margaret the presumptive heir and future queen. It would be nearly two decades before this inevitability became a reality, but Margaret the publicly recalled how her fate changed that day becoming queen has been my goal in life since I was 13 years old, she said in 1989. Me, I'm yours. My task now is my country, my country, my Danes. The teenage princess was a diligent student spending a year at boarding school in England before graduating from high school with exemplary grades and a flair for languages. At Margaret won a seat on the Council of State but where she practiced the intricacies of royal diplomacy and presided over meetings on behalf of her father, the princess immersed herself in all aspects of young royal life, training in the Danish Women's Flying Corps and traveling the world with her Scandinavian cousins to mingle with Hollywood stars. Margaret's thirst for knowledge led her to Cambridge University to study archaeology, a passion she discovered during childhood at excavation vacations in Italy with her grandfather, the Swedish king. It was her desire for prestigious education and travel that led Margaret to her future husband. A young royal meets her faithful consort and takes the throne. In 1965, 25 year old Margaret was studying political science at the London School of Economics when she was invited to a dinner party. There she met Henri de la Borde de Montpezza, who worked as secretary to the French embassy. Apart from the fact that I liked him very much, I didn't pay much attention to Henri, she told her biographer. 
He was just a young man I met from time to time, and in fact, I believe it was he who noticed me, not the other way around. They were reunited a few months later at a wedding in Scotland, and Margaretha said she then fell in love with force. After secret dates for a year, Henry proposed to her and gave her a Mawai E.T. toy ring to huge diamond side-by-side dot to marry the future queen, Henry was forced to make many sacrifices which he said he was happy to make in the name of love. He changed his name to Henrik to sound more Danish, he converted from Catholicism to Lutheranism, and gave up his young diplomatic career. The couple had two sons heir to the throne Frederick in 1968 and the spare joy came the following year. On New Year's Eve 1971, Margaretha's father, King Frederick, delivered his annual address to the nation in which he wished his subjects all the best for the coming year. Just two weeks later, he died. Margaret ascended the throne at the age of 31, becoming Denmark's first female monarch since her namesake ruled the Scandinavian kingdoms in the 14th century. My beloved father, our king, is dead. The task my father carried for nearly 25 years now rests on my shoulders, she said in her first speech. May the trust given to my father be given to me as well. As Queen and Prince Consort, Margaret and Henrik immediately set about modernizing the Danish monarchy. Both artists and intellectuals, they opened their court to Danes of all walks of life, traveling the country to experience their subjects. Brief gave televised press conferences and traveled the world with her husband, meeting with heads of state and politicians, Known for her vibrant and colorful fashion sense, Margaret the wanted to be the queen of Danish hearts and art. The queen is creating a legacy beyond her royal duties. While juggling the roles of mother and ruling monarch, Margaret also earned a reputation as a talented artist. She was fascinated by the Lord of the Rings books when she read it as a bedtime story to her two sons in the early 1970s. Inspired by Tolkien's work, Margaret painted a series of watercolors depicting the landscapes of these imaginary worlds. She sent the author another series of ink sketches under the pseudonym Ingehild Grammer, which were eventually published in a new edition of Tolkien's epic story in 1977. Margaret maintained a passion for the arts throughout her reign, taking an interest in painting textiles, decoupage, embroidery, costume design, and stage design. Her sets and costume designs graced the stages of the Royal Danish Ballet in Copenhagen's Tivoli, and her paintings and embroideries were exhibited in museums and churches throughout Europe. According to the royal household, the queen still sets aside one day a week to devote to her crafts and regularly presents her creations to loved ones, hand-sewn evening bags for friends, linens for the Christmas table, and advent calendars for grandchildren. Dottio many Danes, Queen Margaret was the mother of the nation. While she had long been hospitable, always eager to chat with her subjects, she also had a serious demeanor and was not afraid to scold Danes for their bad behavior. When the COVID-19 pandemic wreaked havoc around the world in 2020, she lectured her subjects on the need to stay at home. Unfortunately, not everyone takes it seriously, she said in a grumpy televised address. Some still throw parties and birthday parties. This is unacceptable behavior. It's thoughtless and, above all, inconsiderate. This direct approach and her willingness to speak her mind on controversial topics, largely avoided by her royal contemporaries, has been widely praised by her subjects. She's not afraid to scold people a little bit. It just adds to her popularity and respect, said Danish fashion designer Julie Brogger. Not all of Margaretha's quirks have been so fully embraced by the public. As many noble sons-in-law can attest, life on the back of the royal family is not always easy. For Henrik, proximity to power was an incredible challenge. Throughout his 50-year marriage, the prince consort has increasingly expressed his frustration publicly. He struggled to acclimatize to Danish culture and learn the language, but more painful than the jokes about his foreign accent was the underlying feeling that he would always be an outsider. As the years passed, he began to complain about his lack of freedom and status. The first hint came around his 50th birthday when he said on television that he found it difficult to ask his wife for pocket money for cigarettes, Henrik's biographer Stephanie Suryog said in 2017. Although he considered himself the queen's equal, he was never portrayed as such to the public. In 2002, Margaret asked her son, Crown Prince Frederick, to represent her at a ceremony on New Year's Day, Henrik took it as a personal insult. 
The Prince consort told tabloids he felt humiliated and degraded by being relegated to third place in the royal hierarchy before traveling to France to reflect on his life. The sudden departure sparked rumors of a royal divorce, but Henrik eventually returned after three weeks in his castle. Royal reporters recall the episode as one that somewhat charmed the Danish public, and at least for a time the couple seemed to put aside their differences. At Margaretha's Ruby Jubilee in 2012, the Queen toasted her husband for his support during her 40 years on the throne. From day one, my husband has been by my side, she said. You, my dear Henri, have supported me and encouraged and inspired me in the work we do. This day is your anniversary, as it is mine. But Henrik never seemed to let go of his grievances over the title, which he believes he earned in exchange for sacrificing his career and home country. In keeping with Danish royal tradition, Henrik wanted his wife to call him her king. Instead, in her 2016 New Year's Eve speech, Queen Margaret announced that her husband was stepping down as a public member of the royal family and would henceforth limit his official commitments. I am the years that followed. Henrik's personal frustrations continued to spill out into the public eye. My wife has decided that she would like to be queen, and I am very happy about that he simmered in a particularly provocative interview in 2017. But as a human being, she should know that if a man and a woman are married, they are equal. She's the one making a fool out of me. After half a century as Denmark's mother, Margaret will be alone. In 2017, when Henrik said he did not wish to be buried with Margaret, the queen said she agreed with his decision. It is no secret that the prince has for many years been dissatisfied with his role and the title he has been given in the Danish monarchy. This dissatisfaction has grown more and more in recent years, her public relations manager, Lean Ballaby, told the publication. For the prince, the decision not to be buried next to the queen is a natural consequence of not being treated equally as his consort for lack of the title and role he desired. A month later, Margaretha's office announced that her husband had been diagnosed with dementia. And on February 13, 2018, Henrik was moved to Friedensborg Palace, a luxury home on the shores of Lake Esram, where a Danish court said he wished to spend the rest of his life. He died later that day, along with his wife and sons. As sincere as she was about her husband's rejection of their funeral plans, Margaret honored his request and cremated his body. Half of his ashes were scattered over the Danish seas and the rest were placed in a private part of the Garden of Friedensborg Palace. Their relationship was as passionate as it was volatile, but the details of his funeral contained one last romantic gesture to his wife. Instead of placing flowers in vases, they were spread out on the floor of the palace's Christiansborg church in what the courtiers called the flowering garden. This arrangement was a reference to Henrik's wedding speech, during which he declared, but I came from the land of flowers to the flowering garden. The girl, however, was the most beautiful ornament of the garden. Margaretha said that when her time came, she still wanted to be buried in a glass sarcophagus. She will lie in her grave in Roskilde Cathedral alone, but the Danes, whom she always put first, will be able to visit the woman they considered the mother of the nation.